So today we'll be talking about lipid metabolism. A couple of quick announcements before we get started. Uh, we have a request for a volunteer note taker for this course. So if you're interested in helping out another student, please email myself or Student Accessibility Services. Ketone papers have been posted to Sakai if you're interested in reading those ahead of time or for those people who are presenting on the topic. Uh, the protein metabolism papers have been uploaded to Sakai now. And the carbohydrate presentations start on Thursday, or they will be on Thursday, where um, please send me your PowerPoint either the night before or make sure to arrive a few minutes early to class so we can get it all set up. Additionally, the papers are due in Sakai Dropbox by 11.55 p.m. that night for the people presenting on those topics. Um, I couldn't set the Dropbox due date to 11.59 p.m., so just be cognizant of that five minute difference. So today's lecture is pretty heavy. We'll be talking about lipids with regards to an introduction to fat metabolism and lipids. We'll talk about fat synthesis, fat breakdown, as well as fat oxidation and uptake before moving into special populations, including uh, obese populations and lipid metabolism, as well as exercise trained or endurance trained individuals and lipid metabolism. So an introduction to lipids. So first, fatty acids are basically composed of a carboxylic acid as well as an alkyl carbon chain. Most of these are typically 16 carbons, and we call this palmitic acid. But in fat metabolism, we actually talk about it as palmitate because the carboxylic acid group is a fairly weak acid with a pKa of 4.5 to 5.0. In this case, for palmitate, it's a saturated fatty acid, so it's a 16 carbon with zero double bonds. Basically, every carbon is saturated with hydrogens, so each carbon has four hydrogen bonds attached to it, and these are all single bonds. However, if we moved on to talk about something like oleate, which is 18 carbons, and it's monounsaturated, meaning that it has one double bond, this is different than our palmitate, which has zero double bonds. So in this case, the alkyl chain is unsaturated, meaning that there is one less hydrogen on the double bonded carbon, because we can only form four bonds. Two of them are taken up by that double bond and the remaining two are hydrogens. We notice that the oleate is in the cis formation, meaning that the hydrogens are on the same side, which produces this kink or this bend in this fatty acid molecule. If they were on opposite sides, they'd be in a trans formation. What we'll notice about this oleate once it goes under beta oxidation to produce acetyl-CoA, it actually produces less ATP as a fatty acid because we need to actually break down that double bond, make it into a single bond before we can actually continue the process of beta oxidation, and this is energetically costly. So basically it's more efficient to oxidize saturated fats when there's no double bonds present. For simplicity in this course, we'll only talk about beta oxidation of saturated fats. So what are triglycerides? Triglycerides are fat molecules that can basically store free fatty acids. Specifically, we take a glycerol backbone and three free fatty acids and bind them to the glycerol backbone via an ester bond. What an ester bond is actually doing is taking the alcohol group on the glycerol backbone and taking the carboxylic group on the free fatty acid, linking them together and producing water in the process. So what we see is that, again, taking the uh, alcohol group on our glycerol molecule, so that OH, as well as the carboxylic acid group on our free fatty acids, combining them, forming water, we create this ester bond. So now we need to talk about how triglycerides are stored. And triglycerides are typically stored in fat cells called adipocytes. How triglycerides are actually stored within this adipocyte is that it forms a large droplet that occupies most of the volume of the fat cell. What you'll see is that there's still a nucleus and there's still mitochondria, but they're actually forced out to the sides or the outskirts of this fat droplet or this adipocyte. This type of adipocyte is a fat storing cell. And what we say is that the lipid droplets are unilocular, meaning one cavity, because locular means cavity. So one single cavity where all of these triglycerides are stored. So if we actually compared white versus brown adipose tissue, white adipose tissue is that unilocular shape where 
All the triglycerides are stored in the middle, taking up the vast majority of that cell. Whereas if we considered brown adipose tissue, what we see is that it's actually multilocular, meaning that we see that the fat cells are actually stored and dispersed throughout that brown adipose tissue cell. We also notice that in the brown adipocyte that there's a number of mitochondria. The mitochondria here, instead of forming ATP, actually form heat by sending basically protons through something called uncoupling protein, three in muscle and one in adipose tissue. So focusing back on white adipose tissue or white adipocytes, which are located in white adipose tissue, looking at this image here, what we see is a group of individual white adipocytes that are bunched together in that unilocular shape. What they actually are, we're looking at here are is lipid droplets that appear to be hollow circles. So within those lipid droplets are actually triglycerides that are being stored in this white adipose tissue. So remember, white adipose tissue has a role in fat storage. On the other side of the picture, we have to think about brown adipocytes. So what brown adipocytes have is basically lipid droplets that are much smaller than white adipose tissue. And what you'll see is that in this brown adipose tissue, there's actually this brownish color. It's produced by having a number of mitochondria and having capillary density, meaning that there's vascularization or blood flow to these brown adipose tissues. Brown adipocytes also have these lipid droplets similar to white adipose tissue, but again, those lipid droplets are dispersed throughout that brown adipose tissue, meaning that it's multilocular or multiple cavities of storage of those triglycerides. And remember again, that brown adipose tissue or brown adipocytes play a role in energy dissipation. So again, using that uncoupling protein to make heat instead of ATP, whereas white adipose tissue plays strictly a role or more of a role in the storage of triglycerides. If we focus on white adipose tissue and where this is actually stored in the body, we can think about two main depots. The first being subcutaneous adipose tissue. This is the majority of white adipose tissue and it's directly beneath the skin. This is the layer of adipose tissue that you can actually pinch or feel between your fingers. Whereas visceral adipose tissue is actually found between the organs uh, within the abdominal region specifically, and it acts like a shock absorber for the organs. This is the type of fat that's commonly associated with poor metabolic health or even adverse health, health outcomes. Lastly, I want to talk about intramuscular triglyceride stores. So we actually know that we have stores of fat within our skeletal muscle. This makes up a relatively small proportion since adipose tissue is our major storage site for fat. But intramuscular triglycerides are about 2% of our total fat stores in our body. And the fat is stored in the form of lipid droplets. In class, we discussed that it's important to have these lipid droplets or these intramuscular triglycerides stored in close proximity to the mitochondria because we know that lipids are a key fuel source for energy provision through mitochondrial respiration. Now I wanna take the time to talk about fat synthesis or how we actually form triglycerides. So recall that triglycerides are again this, this glycerol backbone with three free fatty acids attached to it. Most fatty acids can be synthesized within our body. So de novo just means within our body except the essential fatty acids, which are linoleic and linolenic acid. However, de novo synthesis is still limited in humans in the sense that we can't make enough, free fat, or make enough fatty acids quick enough or in large enough quantities to supply our body's needs. So we actually obtain most of our fatty acids primarily from our diet. We'll notice that triglyceride synthesis is elevated after a meal. One, those meals contain fatty acids, which can be elevated within our circulation. So we have more free fatty acids available to be synthesized into triglycerides. And we also have increased insulin, which is our typical anabolic response after a meal, which can promote fatty acid uptake and storage, similar to the glucose side of things we talked about last week. So what's the first step in triglyceride synthesis? The first step is basically to activate this fatty acid, 
with the enzyme acyl-CoA synthetase. What this actually does is form a fatty acyl-CoA. You'll notice that this process uses two ATP molecules <clears throat> in order to facilitate the production of fatty acyl-CoA. Remember that after a meal, we have increased delivery of fatty acids from that meal itself. This will push that reaction towards the production of fatty acyl-CoA. As well, insulin is going to help us with fat uptake and storage because insulin is anabolic. It's going to help us bring those fat free fatty acids into the cell so that they can actually be formed into triglycerides for storage. The second step now is to form the glycerol backbone. Importantly, the glycerol backbone is known as glycerol 3-phosphate. And how this is formed in adipose tissue is through using glucose to form dihydroxyacetone phosphate, otherwise known as DHAP. DHAP is then turned into glycerol 3-phosphate, and this is all using glycolytic reactions. So now we have our fatty acyl-CoAs, we have our glycerol backbone. We need to actually take our molecules of free fatty acids and bind them to that glycerol backbone. How this actually happens is through acyl transferase, which is an enzyme that adds one fatty acid at a time to that glycerol backbone. So once the first free fatty acid goes onto that glycerol, it's called monoacylglycerol. Once the second free fatty acid is added to that glycerol backbone, it's called diacylglycerol. However, before the third free fatty acid can actually be added on, we need to use something called phosphatidate phosphatase to remove a phosphate group from that glycerol backbone to allow for that last free fatty acid to be bound. Once all three free fatty acids are bound to a glycerol backbone, this is how we have triacylglycerol or triglycerides. They're, these terms are interchangeable. So now that we've talked about fat synthesis or how we make triglycerides, it's important to talk about how we can actually break down those triglycerides through, through a process called lipolysis. So lipolysis is the process, again, of breaking down those triglycerides, liberating the free fatty acids and glycerol backbone. The purpose is basically to provide free fatty acids for substrate in tissues such as skeletal muscle or adipose tissue. We'll notice actually in the adipose tissue, that free glycerol backbone after all three free fatty acids are removed is also released into the blood for gluconeogenesis, or it can be oxidized by other tissues. So a common measure you might see, uh, a blood marker for lipolysis would either be blood levels of the glycerol backbone, or we can actually directly measure uh, circulating free fatty acids as a measure of lipolysis. So what we'll see here, the classic steps involved in lipolysis, so taking that triglyceride, breaking it down, removing one free fatty acid gives us diacylglycerol, taking off another, monoacylglycerol, taking off the last one, we're left with that glycerol backbone. This process involves the liberation of one free fatty acid at a time. So when does lipolysis occur? Lipolysis occurs predominantly um, under conditions of increased energy demand. So we need to mobilize those fat stores in times of increased energy demand. A classic scenario would be exercise. Uh, of course, we need more energy in order to fuel our contracting muscles. Another example would be a low calorie diet or in a scenario of fasting. So we need to provide energy for that resting energy expenditure or a total daily energy expenditure. And in the case of a low calorie diet or fasting, more of our energy demand is going to come from fat as opposed to carbohydrate. Lastly, talking about cold exposure, uh, we talked about in class the idea that in response to cold exposure, our body's ability to shiver is how we try and stay warm. Shivering is just uh, low grade or about 10 to 20% of a maximum voluntary contraction. Uh, muscle contraction. So really low intensity muscle contractions. We know muscle contractions require ATP or an increased energy demand in order to fuel that shivering response. So what really is lipolysis or how does it occur? So basically lipolysis is a coordinated event which leads to the migration and activation of lipolytic enzymes called lipases with, uh, are on the lipid droplet. So these lipases are going to be things like hormone-sensitive lipase, and we'll get into that on the next slide. 
Other than that, we also have this monolayer of phospholipids surrounding our lipid droplet. And importantly, attached to that monolayer of phospholipids is something called perilipin 1. Perilipin 1 is a protein that guards the triglycerides in the lipid droplet, kind of holds them within that shape when we're not needing uh, fat to be broken down. Importantly, perilipin 1 is strictly for or in relation to adipose tissue. So we'll start off by talking about the mobilization of lipids from triacylglycerols or triglycerides through lipases. So the first one I want to talk about is hormone sensitive lipase. This is the lipase that is originally thought to break off fatty acids from a triglyceride molecule. It's thought to be important, especially for the first free fatty acid. So in class, we talked about the idea that, again, hormone sensitive lipase is highly important for breaking off the first free fatty acid from a triglyceride molecule. So if we had a scenario where we had a HSL knockout animal, so we don't have any HSL left in that animal, what fat molecule would actually build up in adipose tissue? And the idea, because we're inhibiting the reduction or the breaking down of triglycerides into diacylglycerol, because that's where HSL actually functions, or we think it functions, we would expect a buildup of trig triglycerides. However, studies have actually done this. So in 2002, not too long ago, a group actually looked at hormone-sensitive lipase knockout rodents and compared them to the wild types. So if we look at our Western blot here, two plus signs is just indicating that our wild type does have hormone-sensitive lipase present, and the two negative signs is our knockout. Those animals do not have hormone-sensitive lipase. So that's a good quality control check right there. After that, they used thin layer chromatography to separate the different fat molecules based on their molecular weight in order to determine which fat molecules were actually present following this hormone-sensitive lipase knockout model. What they found, contrary to our original hypothesis, which if HSL was involved in liberating a free fatty acid from triglyceride to form diacylglycerol, in our knockout model, we would expect increased triglycerides. However, we actually see a buildup of diacylglycerol in these HSL knockout rodents, which is interesting and different than our original hypothesis. So what does that actually mean? We expected an increase in triglycerides following that HSL knockout because we would expect an inability to take that first free fatty acid off of triglycerides. However, we found a rise in diacylglycerol meaning that something else must be responsible for the removal of that first free fatty acid, but hormone-sensitive lipase is definitely important for the removal of that second free fatty acid, so taking diacylglycerol and turning it into monoacylglycerol. So recent evidence actually suggests that three different enzymes are needed to actually efficiently mobilize triglycerides. The first free fatty acid from triglycerides is removed using something called adipose tri triglyceride lipase, or ATGL. The second free fatty acid is removed from diacylglycerol to form monoacylglycerol using hormone-sensitive lipase. And monoacylglycerol to just a glycerol backbone is, is um, catalyzed by monoglyceride lipase, or MGL. So when we talk about ATGL, so again, we're talking about the removal of that first free fatty acid from triglycerides. This is the rate limiting step of lipolysis. So we're going to see how after ATGL does its job, it's kind of rolling through and that it's easier to remove the other free fatty acids from that triglyceride molecule. Importantly, ATGL needs to be co-activated by CGI58. What you'll see in this diagram here is that CGI58 is bound to perilipin 1. Remember, perilipin 1 is surrounding that lipid droplet. And what actually happens is perilipin 1 regulates the activity of CGI58. So in response to uh, beta adrenergic stress, so that fight or flight response, what we would see at, basically with exercise is this increase in epinephrine Epinephrine or norepinephrine binds to beta adrenergic receptors. They see an increase in cyclic AMP, a rise in PKA activation, 
and ultimately we see an increase in perilipin 1 phosphorylation. So again, in response to this beta adrenergic stress, we have a rise in perilipin 1 phosphorylation. That's going to be important because the phosphorylation of perilipin 1 is actually going to release CGI58, allowing it to interact with ATGL. Once it interacts with ATGL, it actually becomes active, and ATGL can then remove the first free fatty acid from triglyceride to form diacylglycerol. So what about the other side of the equation? We've talked about now the activation of ATGL, but what about the inhibition of ATGL? So when we think about the inhibition of ATGL, we have to think about a protein called G0S2. So really recent evidence has shown us that G0S2 interacts with ATGL to inhibit lipolysis. So if we look at the first figure here, what we can actually see is that with increasing concentrations of G0S2, we have a greater and greater inhibition of, of lipolysis, which is marked by uh, circulating free fatty acids. So more G0S2, less free fatty acids liberated from that triglyceride. What we can also see is that on our second figure here, we have ATGL in the presence of CGI58. So remember, CGI58 activates ATGL. But if we also add G0S2 into this picture, we can still decrease the presence of free fatty acids, meaning that there's some competition between CGI58 and G0S2 for the binding to ATGL. So again, the idea that CGI58 is an activator of ATGL and this uh, G0S2 is an inhibitor of ATGL. Another example or another proof of this is by using a knockdown model. So a knockdown of this G0S2 protein is actually, it was created by decreasing the protein content using silencing RNA or siRNA. What silencing RNA actually does is it interferes with the translation of that G0S2 protein, meaning we have a reduction in the total protein content of G0S2. What we see is that uh, we have an increase in lipolysis and fatty acid release. So remember, if we're decreasing G0S2, we're decreasing the inhibition of ATGL's activity, meaning ATGL can go on to do its thing, increasing lipolysis, increasing fatty acid release from that triglyceride. This occurs in both a basal and stimulated state. So stimulated would be something like beta adrenergic stimulation. This suggests, again, that we can remove any inhibition of G0S2 on ATGL and that we can actually promote lipolysis. So G0S2 must be a regulator of ATGL. In this case, we're thinking about G0S2 being an inhibitor of ATGL. So recap, ATGL catalyzes the release of that first free fatty acid from triglyceride, so forming diacylglycerol. And we now know that ATGL is regulated by perilipin 1 and its communication or its interaction with CGI58, as well as G0S2, which is an inhibitor of, of ATGL. And CGI58 is the activator of ATGL. So now I want to move on and talk about that liberation of that second free fatty acid from diacylglycerol to form monoacylglycerol. The enzyme responsible for this is hormone-sensitive lipase, and it's also regulated by beta-adrenergic activation of PKA. So same story, beta-adrenergic uh, response, this fight-or-flight response, we have an increase in epinephrine and norepinephrine. We bind to the beta-adrenergic receptors, increase cyclic AMP, increase PKA activation. And in this case, we actually have a phosphorylation of hormone-sensitive lipase to make it more active. So if we look at this figure here, what we're actually seeing is that this is where we are up into the point of HSL activation. So we had triglyceride released to form, release a free fatty acid to form diacylglycerol, and that was catalyzed by ATGL and its interaction with CGI58. Remember, we had phosphorylation of perilipin 1 to release that CGI58. That's going to be important for the binding of HSL.
So what we see is that typically on that last picture, we saw HSL is not normally bound to the lipid droplet, but that phosphorylation of perilipin 1, which occurred in the first step uh, with ATGL liberating a fatty acid from triglyceride, this phosphorylated perily perilipin 1 acts as a docking site for hormone-sensitive lipase, which is also phosphorylated. This is the kind of leading back to the idea that I talked about a snowball effect. So remember, perilipin 1 was phosphorylated uh, during activation of ACGL, and that was the rate-limiting step of lipolysis. Now it's kind of ticking along in the sense that this phosphorylated perilipin 1 was a docking site for our phosphorylated hormone-sensitive lipase. So now that hormone-sensitive lipase is recruited to that lipid droplet, it's bound to that phosphorylated perilipin 1, we can have diacylglycerol releasing a free fatty acid to form monoacylglycerol. So now, so far we've talked about beta adrenergic receptors, how that stimulates PKA to promote lipolysis. We also need to consider the other side of the equation. We also have alpha adrenergic receptors that norepinephrine and epinephrine can also bind to. Importantly, alpha adrenergic receptors have the opposite action of beta adrenergic receptors because they lead to an inhibition of cyclic AMP production, which is normally catalyzed by um, adenylocyclase or forming uh, cyclic AMP. PKA is actually less active when we have um, alpha adrenergic receptors. And basically what we have is this balance of alpha and beta adrenergic receptors, which can control this PKA mediated lipolysis. Another way that we can decrease PKA activity is through insulin. We know insulin is anabolic. So insulin actually inhibits PKA activation. If we think about the glycolytic side of the picture, Insulin inhibits glycogen breakdown, which is normally catalyzed by glycogen phosphorylase. This breakdown is initiated by PKA phosphorylating glycogen phosphorylase more active. But remember, insulin is going to inhibit that breakdown of, gly of glycogen. On the side of the picture we just talked about, insulin also inhibits PKA activation in relation to the inhibition of triglyceride breakdown which is catalyzed by ATGL and hormone-sensitive lipase, as we just talked about. So insulin, the reason why insulin uh, inhibits PKA activation is this idea, and always this idea, that insulin is anabolic. It wants to store glucose and fats as glycogen and triglycerides, respectively. So how does insulin actually inhibit lipolysis, or how does it actually decrease PKA activity? So insulin binds to its receptor, and it actually activates something called phosphodiesterase, or PDE. Phosphodiesterase plays a role in actually degrading cyclic AMP into uh, 5-AMP, meaning that if there's less cyclic AMP, we're going to have less PKA activation and less activity of ATGL and HSL. So lastly, I don't want to neglect our intramuscular triglyceride stores, so the muscle has lipid droplets similar to adipose tissue. And we also can break down muscle triglycerides or intramuscular triglycerides via ATGL as well as hormone sensitive lipase and monoglyceride lipase. So the same enzymes are present in intramuscular triglycerides for the breakdown of those as is in adipose tissue. The difference resides in the types of perilipin that are present in skeletal muscle. So perilipin two, three, four, five, whereas adipose tissue is perilipin one. If we're actually making a direct comparison, perilipin five in skeletal muscle is thought to regulate ATGL and CGI58, uh, regulate ATGL with the CGI58 interaction, similar to perilipin one in adipose tissue like we talked about earlier. So now I wanna take a, a moment to talk about fat uptake, whether that's skeletal muscle fat transporters and how this might be similar to the GLUT4 transporter we talked about last week. So remember, most of this time we've talked about mobilization of free fatty acids in adipose tissue. 
So once those triglycerides are mobilized into individual free fatty acids, they're actually released into the circulation, into the bloodstream. In the circulation, they have to be bound to albumin because they're fat soluble. They, can, they have to be bound to a lipid transporter, which is this albumin molecule. Of course, in order to use fatty acids for fuel, we need to get them into the skeletal muscle. And the ways that we do this is through a number of key transporters. So the ones we'll typically talk about are fat CD36, fatty acid binding protein, so FABP, or fatty acid transport protein, FATP. Similar to GLUT4, we can have these intramus or, yeah, intramuscular stores of fat CD36 translocated to the plasma membrane with either contraction-mediated um, stimulation, so bringing fatty acids into the muscle for fuel utilization. So again, fat CD36 with skeletal muscle contraction is translocated from an intracellular store to that plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle. On the other side of the equation, we also have insulin-stimulated uh, translocation of fat CD36, again, from those intramuscular stores to the plasma membrane to promote fatty acid uptake. In this case, insulin-stimulated insulin is anabolic, so we want to build triglycerides, so promoting fat, fatty acid uptake in order to store them as intramuscular triglycerides. So now we need to talk about fat transport or intracellular fat transport. Up until this point, what we've done is taken our free fatty acid that was liberated from adipose tissue, and we brought it from outside the cell across that plasma membrane into the cytosol. But we're only halfway there. We have to move that fatty acid from the cytosol to the mitochondria because the mitochondria is where it's, we're going to have the TCA cycle and the electron transport chain. Where we're actually going to be able to use these fatty acids for energy provision. So the first thing we need to do is use the free fatty acids for energy. Um, to use the free fatty acids for energy, we have to enter the mitochondria. So in order to be prepared to be brought across that outer mitochondrial membrane, we actually have to take the free fatty acid, bind it to a CoA group through an enzyme called fatty acyl-CoA synthase to form fatty acyl-CoA. The reason that this is important is because that fatty acyl-CoA is then going to be uh, bound with a carnitine molecule through the enzyme carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1 or CPT1. What this is going to do is transfer that carnitine to the fatty acyl group, so forming fatty acyl carnitine and CoA. The reason that this is so important is because carnitine can actually freely move across the mitochondrial membrane, in this case the outer mitochondrial membrane, into the intermembrane space, and this occurs through diffusion. So carnitine can diffuse across the outer mitochondrial membrane. Then, because uh, fatty acyl carnitine and that carnitine group specifically can diffuse across the outer mitochondrial membrane, it can also cross the inner mitochondrial membrane. So now that we're across the outer as well as the inner mitochondrial membranes, we are inside the mitochondria where we have the reverse reaction of CPT1. So fatty acyl carnitine and CoA is then converted back into fatty acyl CoA and carnitine. This is through the enzyme CPT2. Remember, this is the opposite reaction of CPT1. So just a recap of where we kind of came from and where we went. We had in the cytosol fatty acyl-CoA through CPT1 converted to fatty acyl-carnitine. Remember, carnitine can diffuse across the outer and the inner mitochondrial membrane. So we're now inside the mitochondria. Fatty acyl carnitine is converted to fatty, back to fatty acyl CoA through CPT2. So now that we have fatty acyl CoA inside the mitochondria, how is it actually going to um, be used for energy? So now we need to talk about fat oxidation and ATP provision. So what we do with that fatty acyl CoA is break it down to produce acetyl CoA. Basically, the production of acetyl-CoA requires two carbons from the fatty acyl-CoA, meaning that for each round of beta oxidation, we're making that fatty acyl-CoA two carbons shorter. So for example, if we took a 16-carbon palmitate molecule 
it can produce eight acetyl-CoA, so 16 divided by two is eight. And then we actually undergo only seven rounds of beta oxidation. So if we think about that, we're taking a 16 carbon, so 16 to 14 to 12 to 10 to eight to six to four to two is seven rounds of beta oxidation. Secondly, we're also producing one NADH and one FADH2 per round of beta oxidation. Those reducing equivalents, NADH and FADH2, are going to the TCA cycle, or sorry, are going to the electron transport chain to be used for ATP provision. But the important thing is, is that the acetyl-CoA that we're forming from beta oxidation is actually used to feed the TCA cycle. So what's actually happening here is that acetyl-CoA can go through the TCA cycle, and the goal of the TCA cycle is to produce reducing equivalents, whether that's NADH and FADH2, and that's going to be used in the electron transport chain for the generation of ATP, or the bulk generation of ATP. Importantly, the TCA cycle only produces a net of one ATP per acetyl-CoA, so again, highlighting the role or the idea that the role of the TCA cycle is to produce reducing equivalents, its production of ATP is somewhat lackluster. So what our net gain from one acetyl-CoA molecule is in the TCA cycle is four NADH and one FADH2. So something I wanna talk about that's a bit of an aside and should be more linked to the carbohydrate lecture, but still fits in here, is the idea of what if the reducing equivalents came from glycolysis? So we know NADH and FADH2 are our reducing equivalents. And they're important for the electron trans transport chain in order to generate ATP. But we also know that glycolysis occurs in the cytosol, and we also produce some NADH and FADH2 during this process. So how do we get those reducing equivalents from the cytosol into the mitochondria? First and foremost, the most common shuttling system that we have is the malate aspartate shuttle. What happens in the shuttling system is that NADH is oxidized to NAD+, which means that two electrons are given up. These two electrons are given up to oxaloacetate, and what that does is forms malate. Malate is actually able to cross the inner mitochondrial membrane, and here we see the reverse reaction occur. So malate is actually converted back to oxaloacetate, and those two electrons are actually donated to NAD+, reforming our reducing equivalent NADH. What you'll also see in this reaction if we move to step three is that oxaloacetate is actually converted back to aspartate. This is the only reason we do this is because we need to have this um, system, this cycle continuing continuously. So oxaloacetate to aspartate, aspartate can cross back over that mitochondrial membrane into the cytosol where it can be converted back into oxaloacetate to be repeated where again, NADH donates two electrons to oxaloacetate, forming NAD plus and malate. So again, the important part of this is that we're donating the electrons from NADH to oxaloacetate. Those two electrons change oxaloacetate to malate. Malate can cross that mitochondrial membrane where it can be converted back into oxaloacetate and those two electrons are donated back to NAD plus forming NADH. So really this is a workaround for us to be able to get NADH across that mitochondrial membrane where it can be used in the electron transport chain to generate energy or generate ATP. Important to note that NADH cannot just cross the mitochondrial membrane, which is why we need the shuttling system to occur. Similarly, but different, the glycerol phosphate shuttle, what's happening here is Similar idea, NADH is turned to NAD+, so donation of two electrons from dihydroxyacetone phosphate to glycerol 3-phosphate. This reaction is fueled by G3P dehydrogenase. Glycerol 3-phosphate is able to cross that mitochondrial membrane, and again, this reverse reaction occurs where glycerol 3-phosphate is converted back to dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and those electrons are actually donated to FAD, forming FADH2. This is a less common shuttling system, and in class we talked about the idea how this is a less efficient system because on the mitochondrial side, 
we actually have the electrons donated to FADH or FAD forming FADH2. And we know that FAD or FADH2 enters the electron transport chain at complex two, producing less ATP because it pumps less protons. So you guys have seen these slides before, but important to touch on again is this idea that we have these reducing equivalents, whether they came from the cytosol, from glycolysis, or whether they came from the TCA cycle, um, production of reducing equivalents. What these reducing equivalents are, are they're high energy electron carriers. And basically in the electron transport chain, what we can have is the release of free energy when NADH is oxidized to NAD+, or FADH2 is oxidized to FAD. What this causes is the pumping of protons against their concentration gradient into that intermembrane space. Remember that NADH, when it's oxidized, it pumps 10 protons because it pumps four at complex one, four at complex three, and two at complex four. So four plus four plus two is 10. Whereas FADH2 enters the electron transport chain at complex two, and it therefore only pumps six protons because of four at complex three and two at complex four. What's important to know is that now that we have this proton gradient in the intermembrane space, we can use that proton gradient to drive ATP synthesis. So those protons are actually gonna come down ATP synthase or complex five of the electron transport chain to form ATP. We know that we require four protons to create one ATP. So for NADH, we have 10 protons pumped and we require four to make an ATP. So we have two and a half ATP per NADH or six protons per FADH2 divided by four is 1.5 ATP per FADH2. Now I wanna take some time to talk about lipid metabolism in the context of obesity. So we know that obesity is an epidemic within Canadian society. So as of 2014, over 14 million Canadians were classified as either overweight or obese, where the cost of obesity is estimated at over $7 billion per year. The reason why obesity is a risk uh, for insulin resistance is typically and commonly related to lipotoxicity. So what is lipotoxicity? Lipotoxicity is an increase in circulating free fatty acids associated with obesity as well as an increase in the uptake of those free fatty acids. However, there's no corresponding or compensatory change or increase in fat oxidation. What this does is basically leads to the accumulation of toxic lipid intermediates, whether it's diacylglycerol, fatty acyl-CoA, or long-chain fatty acyl-CoA, or even ceramides. What these toxic lipid intermediates do is they actually interfere with the normal insulin signaling pathway. If we have impaired insulin signaling, we get insulin resistance in these obese populations. How this actually occurs, so one example is how diacylglycerol and long-chain fatty acyl-CoAs can activate stress-related kinases. For example, in this case, we're talking about protein kinase C, in which protein kinase C can actually phosphorylate IRS1 inactive. If phosphorylation of IRS1 inactive is occurring, this means that our insulin signaling cas cascade is kind of cut off and it, we, we get this insulin resistance in these individuals. So an inability to respond to an insulin challenge. Similarly, if we consider ceramides, which are another toxic lipid intermediate, ceramides are typically a healthy sphingolipid that are used in cell signaling or healthy cell signaling However, when we have too much ceramides built up, they can actually impair insulin signaling. How this happens is ceramides can actually activate, activate the junk kinase uh, signaling cascade, which phosphorylates again IRS1 inactive. Ceramides can also inhibit the autophosphorylation of the insulin receptor at the plasma membrane. And ceramides can also inactivate AKT meaning that AS160 does not communicate with the GLUT4 molecule to bring it to the plasma membrane. So ceramides clearly have a number of ways that, that they can inhibit uh, the insulin signaling cascade and cause insulin resistance 
or an inability to respond to an insulin challenge. So what are the solutions for preventing insulin resistance associated with obesity? First, we can increase fat oxidation, whether that is through regular exercise, so again, utilizing those fats for energy provision, or through thermogenesis. Again, thermogenesis is metabolic heat production without the production of ATP. And how we do this in skeletal muscle would be the use of mitochondrial uncoupling protein 3 in the electron transport chain. So instead of making ATP, we actually pump those protons to generate heat. Importantly, both of these processes uh, increase energy expenditure and therefore our oxidation of those increased lipid stores. Alternatively, we can also increase fat storage as safe lipid droplets, so triglycerides. The way that we could promote this is through glycerogenesis, or making more of those glycerol backbones, and this is done in the liver. If we have more glycerol backbones, we can take those free fatty acids and bind them to the glycerol backbone, store them as triglycerides. Yes, we would still have the case of obesity, but we wouldn't have insulin resistance associated with those toxic lipid intermediates. So this is a safer way um, to have obesity because we wouldn't have, again, that insulin resistance. So now I wanna change gears and turn to endurance training and how that might influence lipid metabolism. So first we need to talk about plasma free fatty acids following endurance exercise training. What we'll see is that following endurance exercise training, the rate of appearance of free fatty acids from adipose tissue does not change. So this is plasma free fatty acids, which might seem odd because we know that uh, endurance training is typically associated with increased fat oxidation. But what we need to consider is that lipids are usually mo mobilized from adipose tissue in excess, meaning we have more lipids than we ever need to fuel our resting state or our exercising state. So maybe it's not so important that there's no difference in plasma free fatty acids following exercise training. What we need to maybe consider is how our ability to take up those fatty acids changes following a training uh, program. So what we see here is that following a short nine day training program where they did 60 minutes, an hour of exercise per day at a moderate exercise intensity, we see a, a pretty dramatic increase in total fat CD36 protein content following just nine days of training. But in class, we talked about this idea that, again, similar to what we talked about with the glucose transporter, total fat CD36 protein content is not that important of a measure since we need to consider how much of that fat transporter is actually getting to the plasma membrane because that's how we're gonna take fatty acids up into that skeletal muscle cell to be stored as intramuscular triglycerides or to be oxidized for fuel. Thankfully, someone else came along about eight years later, performed a study looking at not only whole muscle stores of, this fat, of these fat transporters, but also how much gets to the plasma membrane. So they did six weeks of high intensity interval training. They took measures at baseline, which is the white bars, two weeks, the gray bars, and six weeks, the black bars. What they found in this case was looking at fatty acid binding protein. They found an increase in the MH, which is our total muscle stores, following both two and six weeks. So in a relatively short period of time, we have an increase in the total fatty acid binding protein. But they also found that at the sarcolemma, so at the plasma membrane, there was an increase in the fatty acid transporter actually at the plasma membrane at two weeks and six weeks of training following an exercise bout. This means that endurance exercise training or exercise training that induces endurance adaptations can enhance fat uptake into skeletal muscle for oxidation. So what about, now we've talked about bringing fatty acids into the skeletal muscle, what about stores that already exist in the skeletal muscle? So we're talking about intramuscular fat stores or intramuscular triglycerides. So what this study did was they had participants come in five to six times a week. They did two hours of cycling during each session at a moderate intensity. And they did this for 31 days. And what they did was they took measures of intramuscular triglycerides at 
baseline five days and 31 days into this training protocol. And what they found was that at 31 days of training, there's a dramatic increase in baseline intramuscular triglyceride stores. So that's our triangles there. And what they also found was that during a 90 minute submaximal exercise bout, that these intramuscular triglyceride stores were used to a greater extent following exercise training compared to five days of training and baseline. How we know that is because if we follow the triangle group on this diagram, we see that they start at a higher baseline, but the end result is about the same, meaning they used a greater proportion of intramuscular triglycerides to fuel that exercise bout. Lastly, we need to consider fat mobilization. So how are we able to mobilize those intramuscular triglyceride stores and can, how do we actually use them for endurance exercise performance? So this is an eight week endurance exercise training program. What they found was that following this eight week training program, there was a dramatic increase in ATGL protein content, as we can see in the figure on the top corner. However, what they also found was that there was no change in HSL protein content, which might seem counterintuitive, but they also measured HSL protein activity. And what they found was that HSL protein activity was increased following this eight week training program. And this is evidenced by phosphorylation of serine 660 on HSL, which promotes HSL activity and less phosphorylation on serine 565 which is known to decrease HSL activity. So the net result is increased or elevated hormone sensitive lipase activity or an increased ability to mobilize these fatty acids from triglycerides to diacylglycerol as well as monoacylglycerol to use them as fuel for exercise performance. So again, taken together, suggests that endurance exercise training increases our ability to mobilize these intramuscular lipid stores to use them for fuel for exercise performance. So what about mitochondrial content? Eight weeks of endurance exercise training, we see significant increases in mitochondrial content. And this is evidenced by measuring citrate synthase protein content. Uh, this is a marker of mitochondrial content because it is a key enzyme in the TCA cycle. If we have a greater mitochondrial content, this actually benefits exercise performance because we have dispersion of the workload. What I mean by that is if we, for example, had a steady state bout of exercise, so we're exercising at 250 watts for 20 minutes, this requires a fixed amount of ATP in order to fuel that exercise bout. If we have more mitochondria working together to generate that ATP, it's less stress on each individual mitochondria and it makes the job easier. The analogy that we talked about in class is this idea of having 200 construction workers building a house compared to 20 constructors building a house. It's going to be a lot more efficient and get done more quickly the more construction workers we have building that house and it's a lot less stress on those individual workers if there's more people contributing to get that job done. So again, more efficiency if we have more mitochondria. So we also talked about this idea of mitochondrial function. So eight weeks of endurance exercise training, we also noticed that we have improved functioning of the mitochondrial complexes. So we talked about on this figure here, GM means glutamate and malate. So we're feeding complex one of the ETC. Uh, palmitoyl carnitine and malate is PCM. What this just means is that we're skipping CPT1. And if we talk about SR, we're talking about succinate and rotenone, meaning that we're skipping complex one, starting at complex two. This isn't really that important. All I want you guys to know is that black bars are trained, white bars are untrained. Following exercise training, not only do we see an increase in mitochondrial content as on the last slide, but we also see an improvement in the functioning of each individual mitochondria as well. So the last thing I want you guys to think about with this lecture is the idea that we've now talked about that both obese individuals and athletes have increased muscle lipid stores. This is termed the athlete's paradox because obviously they're very different uh, phenotypes and very different responses on how they use these lipid stores. 
So athletes are known to be insulin sensitive, whereas obese individuals are insulin resistant. How does this actually occur? We need to think about the idea that we've now highlighted a number of reasons why athletes have a greater ability to oxidize those increased lipid stores and how that leads to a decreased accumulation of these toxic lipid intermediates. Whereas obese individuals, they have this increased free fatty acid, increased fat uptake, but they don't have the capacity for increased fat oxidation, meaning they have this accumulation of toxic lipid intermediates that then contribute to insulin resistance and the idea of obesity-induced insulin resistance.